tell you something. This is the first time I remember more people are towards the front of the auditorium than the back. This must be a good sign. Are you doing o uh, Oak Ridge uh, first? Oh, that's the difference. You're not <laughs> wiped out already. Okay. All right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, the first, the first two lectures are, uh, of today, this morning. The first one is on neutron reflectometry, and the second one is about polarized neutrons. However, the second lecture contains a lot of reflectometry examples that are uh, applications in hard condensed matter physics. So this first talk is mostly about applications of neutron reflectometry to soft condensed matter, organic systems, things like this, biofilms, chemical films, photovoltaic cells, that kind of stuff, okay? If you have any questions, please just say question, because if you put your hand up, believe it or not, when I look out there, I just trance and I you know, look right over. So please do that, and then you could help me out if you remind me to please repeat the question, okay, because I always forget to do that. All right, so uh, let's begin. Uh, the other thing is, well, two other points. The other one is that this lecture may not end at the end of the time, and we may just finish it into the second half. I, sometimes it turns out that way better, but we'll get through both of them. The, second, the last point is that there are way, way too many slides and information in these two lectures that you have, a, or have probably already seen to cover. But it's there just for your reference, okay? There's some appendices and stuff like that. And I guess that wasn't the last point. There's still yet another one. Most of this applies to neutrons, but the reflectometry general principles apply to x-rays as well. So remember that, and in fact, in one of the appendices, there's even stuff about magnetic x-ray scattering in the back, if you're gonna do that at some point in Argonne, or in your careers, or whatever. Okay, so remember, ask questions if you have them, and let's start out here. Okay, so this is base, the, the basic idea of this. The appendices are mostly there for your uh, uh, reference, but if you have questions, that if you see something interesting in there or not, uh, if you do see something interesting, uh, we can talk about it too. But there are first three parts, just the basic ideas, some applications, and something about one of the big problems with reflectometry that's also a problem in all of scattering, and that's the phase problem. Okay, so here's the first part, the basic ideas about you know reflectometry, what's special about it, and uh, how just a general outline of, of what we do. Okay, now a lot of these points here you've already heard a zillion times about, you know, neutrons can see hydrogen and deuterium very differently, whereas X-rays do not, and in fact, even scattering from hydrogen is so weak that you can barely see it. The other thing is polarized neutrons are very useful in studying magnetic systems because they have a magnetic moment. Of course, you can do magnetic X-ray scattering too, but this is just to point out, again, that it's the isotropic contrast that makes neutrons particularly complementary to X-rays, okay? Also, it penetrates macroscopic distances in materials, so for reflectometry in particular, if you're studying something in a fluid cell where you have a system, a film system, adjacent to a liquid reservoir, you can have on the other side of the film that you're interested in, a big piece of single crystal silicon or sapphire neutrons go right through this. So you can study things in situ with almost no loss. Okay, the fact that neutrons scatter so weakly make it relatively, use the word relatively here, easy to analyze and interpret the data that you collect as opposed to electron diffraction, which is notoriously difficult, or atom beam scattering to model the scattering field. And neutron reflectometry by this point, after 30 or 40 years of it, since its inception, has become a really standard way of studying thin film systems. Okay. There's also some special things about neutron reflectometry, as you'll see, I hope, in the, in, in, as we progress to the slides, and that is that 
In physics, there are really very, very few problems that can be solved to very high precision and accuracy almost exactly. And what we call specular neutron reflectometry, which we'll talk about in a minute, is one of those one-dimensional scattering problems that we have a quantitative, almost exact solution to. So it's very valuable just as a model of how scattering works in studying uh, systems with neutrons and x-rays. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about this phase problem. And in fact, there is a way to solve the phase problem in neutron specular reflectometry. Okay, it's, it's almost impossible to overemphasize how important it is to, to construct or fabricate the proper sample to study. There's this old adage, garbage in, garbage out, and this is really one of the most important things. You can have these wonderful facilities like the ILL, like the SNS, Typher, the NIST reactor, wonderful instruments to study things with, but if the sample is no good, is not homogeneous, is not what you want to study, you're not gonna get anything out of it. So unfortunately, a lot of time has to be spent preparing samples that are appropriate to study with the, with the probes, with x-rays and neutrons, okay? So let's start, specular reflectometry. Well, specular means nothing more than you control the scattering situation so that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So if you have a neutron or an x-ray coming in and reflecting from a surface, if you control the angle of incidence to be at a glancing angle theta and then put your detector here so that it only sees those neutrons or x-rays that are scattered at the same magnitude of angle, okay? That's called the specular condition and what it means is that the momentum transfer is perpendicular to the surface. And if you go through this, the mathematics of it, what it means is that you're only sensitive when you maintain that condition to changes in scattering density in the power of the potential pre causing the scattering that are normal to the surface of a flat film. Again, for neutron reflectometry, the special geometry is that it's a flat surface, okay? All right, if you maintain that condition, the so-called, in, in physics speak, con, uh, components of the momentum along, in plane, along this interface, are constants of the motion, they don't give you any information. Now, if you were to change this condition and put your detector over here, you would have a non-specular situation and then you would have this wave vector transfer tilted to the normal, from the normal, and you would be able to sense fluctuations in the plane. Okay, but we're gonna talk mostly today about the specular condition just as an introduction and it's the easiest to understand and it's the most used. Because as it turns out, non-specular scattering is much weaker and it's also relatively hard to, uh, uh, in comparison, to analyze. But this does not mean that you have to have a perfectly homogeneous film in the plane. If there are fluctuations in the plane, like this cartoon picture sort of suggests, then you average across those fluctuations and as long as the fluctuations aren't too big, that averaging process gives you still a very, very good approximation to the specular condition and, it, and it's you know, on the order of a few percent still uh, accurate. I mean, a order of a few percent uh, uncertainty or in error because of that. So just keep that in mind as we progress. Okay, so this, this slide is supposed to overview the paradigm again, everything I just said in one, in one uh, slide. So if you control this experiment again in specular condition, you measure the reflected intensity and the reflectivity is just the reflected intensity divided by what was incident in the intensity of the beam coming in. And if you measure that as a function of angle from lowest angle to higher, higher, higher angle or as a function of wave vector transfer, which is this four pi sine of that angle over the wavelength, you measure that as a function of, of the wave vector transfer, that information here, this reflectivity profile can be inverted 
to give you the depth profile of some structure that's sitting on some flat surface. So here's a lipid, just a cartoon of a lipid bilayer in this ball with head and tail groups. And as you scan this, you get the information that gives you the scattering density, or we'll just we'll talk about that more in a minute, but the scattering power of the material as a function of depth. So you average across here, you average across here, average across in, in planes parallel to the substrate, and you get this depth profile as a function of depth Z, let's say, into the film. That's the whole paradigm. That's the idea of spectral reflectometry, both for X-rays and neutrons. So if you look at this picture here, suppose you had spheres sitting on the surface, or cylinders, or lamellar structures. Then the profiles, the depth profiles along the normals to the surface would look like this, for this case, and this for that, and so on. So I think you get the picture. Okay, and That's what you're getting out. And you're getting that information out to nanometer resolution or fractions of a nanometer resolution. Okay, so let's just review a little bit about the scattering. And again, we won't go into much detail. Uh, and by the way, if you have questions that I can't answer today, please email me. I'll be happy to answer, answer you. And believe it or not, people have done this in previous schools. They've actually emailed me. We've had a little correspondence going. So it works nicely. Don't be afraid to do that. Okay, and don't be afraid to ask questions. No questions are stupid. The only thing that's stupid is not asking questions if you don't understand something. Okay? So here we go. Uh, the beam, if we could describe a neutron as a wave, as a plane wave, uh, in, actu in actuality, it's really a superposition of many plane wave eigenstates that create a wave packet because a plane wave extends infinitely in space. And that's totally, a, it's, a, it's a mathematical idealization, but a physical absurdity. It doesn't exist. But the, the wave packets, these football-shaped things you may have seen in some, in some presentations in quantum mechanics of, of signal-free particles like neutrons or, or electrons, these wave packets are a superposition of these states. So if we solve one, the solution for a superposition of these is also valid. So it's easier to talk in one component at a time, as though it was perfectly monochromatic. So if you think of this plane wave, it's just a sinusoidal oscillation, a real part, a cosine and a sine term. The neutron, when it reflects from a surface, it's not like a hard sphere just bouncing off the surface. You could tell things from that. If I had tennis balls here and I threw them off the stage at a given angle and they reflect at some angle, I could actually deduce where they bounce to where the stage actually was, and that there's a hard surface there. But neutrons and x-rays do more than that. It's like a flying ruler. There's a scale in this probe, in this, in this neutron and x-ray that are coming in. And that scale is the wavelength, okay? That wavelength is like a ruler with centimeters. Well, of course, it has to be metric. But these neutrons and x-rays probe surfaces by sticking the ruler in and measuring where different changes in the density actually are in real space. So the physics, the way that the equation of motion that tells you what happens to that wave as it propagates to the surface is described by the Schrodinger equation. There's a kinetic energy term, and if there's something, some material in the vacuum that is causing the scattering, there's a potential, and the sum of these energies have to equal the total energy of the system that you consider to be the neutron. And when it's, this is just like the wave equation for light, except it applies to the wave, uh, the neutron waves or, uh, as well. And the solution of this equation will tell you how the wave function changes when it interacts with some material. So again, this is just brief review, go through this quickly, but the, in our case for reflectometry where the material, you don't, you're at small enough wave vector transfers that you don't see the grittiness of the atomic or nuclear structure, you just see the average scattering density. This potential can be characterized by the number of atoms, or actually in the case of neutrons, nuclei per unit volume multiplied by some characteristic scattering length, which is really the scattering, a measure of the scattering power of that particular nucleus for the neutron-nucleus interaction. So this density is a way that is the potential is described 
there can be a real and imaginary part where the real part of that density corresponds to the scattering and the imaginary part to absorption, absorptive processes where the neutron actually gets captured by the nucleon. Okay, so in this case, if we describe it this way, we can say, okay, what's the total, if we think back to the equation before, this Schrodinger wave equation, in vacuum, the energy is just all kinetic, okay? But in a material, there's kinetic energy and there's some potential term, and the conservation of energy, we're talking about elastic scattering, okay, not in elastic processes, requires that energy be conserved, and if I equate in the vacuum to in the material, I get a wave equation like this that contains uh, a term with the potential that can be cast in the form of a refractive index, just like in classical light optics. So the whole potential for different materials can be described as a, 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 a particular refractive index. It's different for different materials, for metals, for semiconductors, whatever. Okay, so to make a long story short, if we solve the Schrodinger equation for this specular condition, it turns out that the reflected amplitude, the reflected wave amplitude is related to the scattering density by this integral equation. So this wave function here, this psi, is the wave incident in free space, just the plane wave we started with. This is the scattering density that can be described in terms of refractive index. And this wave function is a problem. That wave function is a function of the depth into the material, and it changes all over the place. It's what the wave is doing as it propagates into the medium that's scattering it, okay? Now, in most cases for neutron scattering, it turns out very nicely that the scattering is so weak that you can approximate the wave in the material with the same form as the wave that was incident. It isn't, very, isn't perturbed very much. And in this case, you can make an approximation such that now the reflection amplitude is equal to the integral of the scattering density multiplied the uh, e to the i q z, where q is just k f minus k i the scattered wave vector minus the incident wave vector because we've assumed they have the same form. Well, lo and behold, this is the famous Fourier transform relationship between the reflected wave and the scattering density distribution, okay? And for most scattering, for diffraction, for example, from powders and so on, this is what works and this is what people use. All right, well, that's all well and nice, but here's an actual reflectivity curve for a potential that looks like this. So this is a scattering density pro uh, profile. So this is scattering density on the vertical. This is the depth into the film, and it's high here, and it goes down to some model system. And if you look at this, these, there are two reflectivity curves, one the exact curve and one the curve that is given by that Born approximation, that Fourier transform relationship we just looked at. And out here at sufficiently high wave vector transfer, they're almost exactly identical. But it's kind of a paradoxical statement to say that neutrons are a weak probe when at very low Q, this approximation that assumes they're a weak probe, a weak probe completely breaks down. So at very low Q, both for X-rays and neutrons, that assumption is wrong, it's invalid, it doesn't work. So if this, in this regime, we have to have a better, more accurate solution. So in other words, what it means is up to some point at low enough glancing angles, the neutrons and x-rays are so strongly reflected that every single one comes back. It's like mirror, it is mirror reflection. It's like seeing yourself in the mirror in the morning when you get up. So the way to solve that is actually you just take a step backward and not make that Born approximation, and you solve the Schrodinger equation exactly. And for this one-dimensional specular case, it turns out it's possible to do this with very high accuracy and precision. So again, I've illustrated beam in, beam reflected, beam transmitted from this potential along Z in this simple uh, cartoon representation because remember the specular problem that we're talking about is in fact just one dimensional. So the only thing that counts is the function z, that spatial coordinate. 
Okay, so if you solve this equation exactly, we won't make that Born approximation and we'll have hopefully a better representation of what the potential is actually doing to the neutron beam. Well, one way to solve this, again, because we can impose conditions that the wave function here and its first derivative are conserved, are constant at each interface, which means that momentum and particle number are conserved. If I impose that condition, I can solve this problem in what's called piecewise continuous fashion and equate the wave function in to the wave function in out, out incident here outside the medium to that inside the medium and the, medium and the beam transmitted at this interface to that inside. And if I set up that condition, I get an algebraic, a system of linear algebraic equations that relate the transmitted amplitude and the reflected and incident amplitudes via this matrix, a uh, set of linear simultaneous equations where these constants of the so-called transfer matrix contain all the information about the potential. But this is an exactly solvable system. And if you have something more complicated than that single slab, that single rectangular block as a potential, I can take any arbitrary potential and put it into a bread slicing machine and slice it up into these little slabs that are themselves constant scattering length density and rectangular potentials. I can, I can slice it so thin to any desired degree of accuracy that this represents, a, it becomes a very good representation of the actual continuous density distribution. And the scattering transfer matrix that describes this arbitrary potential is just the product of all of this single rectangular slab potentials for each piece that I sliced it into, each slice of bread. So if I look at this, I can characterize, I can model this, and remember that these coefficients are described in terms of the refractive indices of the material average scattering density of the material in each slab, and I can go ahead and, and solve this. Okay, let's talk about some actual examples. Here's an example of just a semi-infinite potential, like the stage. Pretend the stage extends infinitely down into the ground, and I reflect neutrons from it. Well, up to a certain critical angle, all of the neutrons are reflected back. And the critical angle is given by this expression. But after that, the reflectivity falls off like a rock. It goes to as one over Q to the fourth. And it falls off very, very quickly. This is anal analogous to the sands perot law, okay, for scattering in that, in that situation. Now, if you don't have, you have the same semi-infinite system, but now the interface in the front is soft, so the scattering density is actually lower here, gets bigger, bigger, and bigger to a maximum value over some finite distance. Then the scattering falls off even faster. But this increased rate of fall off is a direct measure of what? Of how hard or soft that interface actually is, how rough it is, okay? So there's a roughness measurement right there. So this, this is kind of the low-hanging fruit that you get out of looking at the reflectivity curves in certain systems. It's, as you might expect, it gets more complicated the more complicated the system is. So suppose now you have a film that has a front and a back. Well, you get interference at the front and interference at the back, and these conspire to give a reflected intensity that has an oscillation, a regular periodic oscillation in the reflectivity curve and the period of that oscillation is 2 pi over, what do you think? Anybody have a guess? The thickness of the film. So it's again this reciprocal relationship between real and scattering or reciprocal space that, that uh, manifests itself here. So 2 pi over that gives you the thickness of the film. Another instant answer to a problem if that's what you're interested in finding out. Now, if I have some more complicated structure, like a multi-layered structure with many different interfaces, and let's say it's periodic with a triangular scattering density distribution, then you'll get, again, a series of peaks in the reflectivity curve that have a period of, guess what, 2 pi over that particular period of the oscillation, of the, oscill the repeat of the real space cell. 
So again, this reciprocal relationship between the scattering space and the actual real space structure. Okay, so let's, let's look at a little, little bit about numbers. What can you really measure? What, what is the length scales that we're really sensitive to? So here's a real reflectivity curve. This is a, for this system here. Okay, so again, the film, this is the perpendicular to the film is along the horizontal axis here. So on your left, all the way over here, is a block of perfect single crystal silicon that the beam comes in through and is almost, almost zero attenuation in this. And then there's a chromium layer followed by a, a gold film of about, I guess this one turns out to be 50 angstroms thick or so. And then there's a lipid bilayer here. This is one half of the lipid bilayer and here's the other half. Those two lipid leaves are like one of the first slides I showed where there's a, a, a head and a tail group and then a tail and a head group sitting on the surface. Now, does anybody have any idea, if they're identical, why this scattering density looks so low and this scattering density looks so high? What do you think was done to this lipid bilayer system when they created it? Well, what they did was they took the head groups and the tails and they deuterated the tails in this upper outer leaflet and they left this lower leaflet hydrogenated. So there's a huge phase contrast or a huge scattering length density contrast between the lower leaflet and the upper leaflet. So that makes it stand out. So if you want to see the two things interdiffusing into one another, this is the way to do it. Okay. So here's the system. This is typically 50 angstroms for, a, or a, for a, 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 a typical lipid bilayer system. And then it's next to a deuterated reservoir, D2O reservoir. So this is the actual profile that was extracted from this reflect specular neutron reflectivity data. Now you can see that the reflectivity data falls off by many, many orders of magnitude. It's down to one millionth of its intensity at below the critical angle here. And this curve just shows that if you measure the reflectivity curve out to this point, you get this coarser resolution in real space. And if you measure further and further out, you get more and more of the detail back. So again, just like lengths in real space are reciprocally related to the positions in Q space, here for the inversion, remember this Fourier-like relationship between real and reciprocal space and scattering space, the farther you measure data or collect data out to in Q, the more detailed the spatial resolution is in the object that's giving rise to the scattering when you analyze the data. Okay, so that's a general principle that holds for all scattering. So, okay, so the, the punchline here is that if you were measure out to a Q of one reciprocal angstrom, you have a spatial resolution of the order of uh, a third of a nanometer, three angstroms, okay? And it's possible, as you'll see, in really some situations and ideal conditions to get out almost to this, almost to the present, uh, present uh, facilities, sources, and instruments. Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about some applications now. So this, in this first lecture, we're only gonna talk about the soft condensed matter because the Ex the examples for hard condensed matter, which are mostly magnetism for neutrons, will occur in the, we'll talk about in the next, in the next lecture, okay? So before we start this, does anybody have any questions about the first part? Yes? Oh, okay, excellent question. And I'm gonna re try to rephrase it and, and, and remember to ask the question again. So we're, we see about, uh, the question was, okay, you have the scattering density that you are modeling by some scattering process. So you measure reflected intensity and you try to work back to get the structure out. But how do you, the question was, how do you know that you're getting the order right? That when you, when you, when you see a profile that you extract from your data that looks, let's, let's go back one slide here. Suppose I, I look at this data, how do I know that this came 
in this sequence. That the, is that the question? The gold comes first and then this. Well, that's an excellent question because I'll show you a situation, in fact, where you can get it completely wrong. So if you were to able to measure the reflected amplitude, the wave amplitude, the phase information is there. And the phase just means what the sequence of the scattering materials are in the order that the neutron wave encounters them. When I square that to get the reflected intensity, which is the only thing I can measure directly, all that information is lost. And then you have to make some intelligent decisions. You know that you deposited, if, if, unless you were totally clueless and out to, out to lunch, and didn't remember that you deposited the gold film on the silicon first before you put the lipid bilayer on, then you could force the model. You might get two solutions to the uh, scattering data, and then you know which one is the right one. So that's an excellent question, and we're going to come back to that in, 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 the, in part three of this, so we'll just make it really short. Okay? I've got a question. Yes. Over here. Yes. Uh, Yes, another excellent question. So the question is, you may have a model like this, but when you, when you know that the Fourier transform is an infinite transform, it goes from minus infinity to in plus infinity. Well, it turns out here that you can assume that the D2O, your reservoir, extends infinitely because the neutron, when you do this reflectivity experiment, never encounters anything beyond that. It's not like it goes out the back of the cell. That's a really important question. If you made the cell so thin that the, some of the neutrons did get out the back of the cell, then you would get a garbage answer out. That's really important. And I think that that'll become evident when I show you a picture of a, an actual cell and where the beam actually goes. And again, another really important thing in here is the neutron is not a plane wave. It really is a wave packet and it has a finite transverse extension space, so it doesn't sample everything. If you do a neutron reflection experiment here at SNS, and you have the beam incident on the sample, that plane wave doesn't extend out to somebody else's reflectometer at the ILL in France, okay? It just doesn't, but that's what the theory says. You know, it sees everything, it doesn't, okay? But again, to analyze the data, it turns out that doing it in this uh, the mathematical formalism in terms of plane waves still works as long as you remember that there are limitations to that interpretation. And one of them being that you have to assume that the neutron doesn't see out there. It only sees up to some point in the depth in the reservoir. Okay? Um, wow, really good question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's go as our first example to this lipid bilayer example. So, in, in, uh, in years past, I've, and I still do, work with uh, uh, two people at NIST a lot, Ann Plan in the biochemistry division and Susan Kruger in our neutron scattering group. And they're biologists, they're biophysicists, and they're really interested in uh, lipid bilayers and the membrane proteins that embed themselves in it. So again, remember, these, the real cells, the real cell membranes are incredibly complicated. They have like 15 million different entities, peptides, proteins, all kinds of different lipid mixtures, cholesterol, everything mixed in. So if you're going to be a sci do a scientific study of this, you've got to take the reductionist approach. You prepare a system that has only one lipid in it. So the lipid system is all the same, DOPC or whatever. And then you go and you introduce only one protein at a time and study that, okay? That's the reductionist approach that we have to follow here to make any sense out of what is horrendously complicated in nature. We have to learn one step at a time. Those are baby steps, right? Okay, so here's a system. Uh, in this particular uh, system that we're gonna look at for this neutron reflectometry example, the idea was to put one component uh, 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 this toxin called melatonin, and I'm not a biologist, so if I say something wrong, so I'm sorry, excuse me. But the idea was to see in this lipid bilayer system that was deposited by putting a sulfur in the head group of one of the leaflets and 
having a bond to the gold film beneath it, which is on top of silicon, to prepare this simple, relatively simple membrane system. And the question was, if I put melatonin, which is the real molecule, it's the real thing from bee venom actually, uh, to see where it actually goes. How do we know where it goes when it interacts with a cell membrane in, 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 in a body, in, in an animal's body or your body or whatever? So these little black globules are supposed to represent the melatonin and where do they go? Do they not interact at all? Do they sort of embed themselves slightly or stay on the surface or really penetrate into one of the leaflets? Now here's the thing that still amazes me to this day. The samples that we look at are something like an inch, a square inch or two square inches of surface. And the lipid bilayer system is 50 angstroms thick. So the total amount of sample in this system being studied is about a millionth of a cubic centimeter. Talk about small samples. This is a small amount of scatter material. Yet, you can get detailed information from this that has a resolution in space of a few nano, a, a fraction of a nanometer. It, this is just incredible. Okay, so here we go. This is the reservoir. And here is the neutron coming in. Here's the silicon, uh, a silicon bla a backing block to limit the amount of scattering you get in the background. The substrate is also silicon, but it sits on a thicker silicon block, so the beam always comes in through silicon. Here's the film, and here's the reservoir that you're in contact with. Now, slits are set up so that you always maintain a footprint that extends only across the film that's in contact with the reservoir, and you don't see the gas gets in any of the other junk. Okay, But to, to go back to your question, here, again, this neutron is not an infinite plane wave coming in like this, with plane wave fronts that extend infinitely. It is restricted to something of the order, as it's been measured, of about one micron. So as long as you make these reservoirs bigger than a micron, you're going to completely confine the neutron to interact only with the materials in this, in this uh, cell setup. Here's the actual data. And this was uh, collected from a reflectivity of one down to about 10 to the minus seven level out to a Q of 0.72 actually, reciprocal angstroms, really far. One of these sets of data is a set of data is with melatonin, one is with, uh, without. And you can see that over several places in this spectra, there, this is a log plot, you can remember, there are big differences with and without. So you're seeing in this already very thin sample, tiny, tiny amounts of melatonin present. And if I accentuate the differences by plotting the reflectivity as a function of, or, or multiplied by the Q to the fourth, remember things are falling off as Q to the fourth, you can see that the difference is even more clearly, especially in here and here. And if you, numerically analyze that data, solving those simultaneous equations in that piecewise continuous solution fashion is fine. The, the gold isn't shown in this particular plot, just the two leaflets of the bilayer, that the melatonin resides only in the vicinity of the head group. It sort of penetrates into the head group, but it's absolutely clear that it doesn't extend into the head groups uh, at the bottom or in much, very much into the tails at all. So the thickness of these lines is actually a measure of the uncertainty in the, in the uh, model that's fitting of that data. And essential to lots of these organic systems uh, uh, analyses and fitting of the data is to do molecular dynamic simulation in conjunction. And here is the, uh, the whole system shown with the uncertainties for the system where the melatonin actually, this is without the melatonin, I believe, yeah. And this is the lipid head groups on the top leaflet, and this is, these are the tails in the bottom two, the gold that bond, uh, the sulfur atoms that bond to the gold. And this is the, one of these, I don't remember which one, I'm sorry. One of them is the actual data, and let's say it's the purple, and the red is the molecular dynamic simulation, and you can see the really, really good agreement here. Okay, so to make more complicated systems, it's again really important to prepare, prepare the samples properly, and that is why you need to work in teams with experts. Here's uh, David Vanderide, and this is an expert in creating these tethered structures. 
substrate, you could suspend the lipid bilayer over the substrate and then have study systems that include proteins that are transmembrane. They actually extend right through, so you have reservoir on both sides. So there's lots of things that you can do if you design the sample properly. Okay, these are some of my coworkers at NIST who have done, studied actually real life important things. Uh, different disease uh, uh, pathogenic, pathogenic biomolecules and have now gotten to the point where they can really model where things reside, how they penetrate into, into these lipid bilayer systems. And I, I think these results are spectacular. They, I, I'm amazed every time I see this, what they can do. There's the dengue virus and how it sticks into the surface of this particular model membrane structure. And okay, you can look at these pretty pictures and, and study them, but I think they're pretty impressive actually. Uh, here's just another, I'll just go quickly through this because I want to talk a little bit about some of the other things about that phase problem. But here is Ursula Perez Salas who worked with us uh, in the past. Uh, she's now at the University of Illinois. She is, um, uh, was studying with Elliot Chaikoff who is a vascular surgeon. And when you get a, a, a vein a graft or you need a vein to replace someone, that, a vein that's damaged, you usually have to take it from another part of your body because if you try to put something artificial in there, the, the body rejects it. So this uh, vascular surgeon was studying, he was also a PhD research scientist at Emory University Medical School and he wanted to study different coatings on uh, materials that would be biocompatible. So to make a long story short, neutron reflectometry was excellent for doing this. And one of the questions that he wanted to answer along the way was, in this particular system, we won't go into the details, but there's a phospholipid layer, polyelectrolyte on top of the substrate. Where does the water go when you put this in a solution? Just like where, the blood, where does the blood go in a real vein when you look at this type of coating on an artificial vein? And so reflectometry measurements were made and from that, it was able, we were able to do, so again, the trick was done by using D2O, heavy water, and light water, and getting different variations, different contrasts. It was able, you were able to do set, deduce at the end that most of the water, if you looked at the density of water as a function of depth, most of it actually penetrated in through the upper two layers into the polyelectrolyte layer and resided in there at something like a 40% level. So it really gets through that. Okay, so in the last part here, uh, let's talk about, uh, about this, this phase problem. So here is uh, a, a set of data. This is neutron reflectivity data for scattering from, okay, I didn't mark it here. I should go back and fix this slide at some point, but just see if you can remember this. On the left over here is a silicon substrate block. Then there's a layer of titanium, okay, and the titanium is a negative scattering density, which occurs for some of the elements for neutrons. So instead of being a positive scattering power, it's a negative scattering power. We can go into details why. Maybe Roger can already talk about that. But then on top of that titanium, pure metal layer, is an oxidized layer of titanium. So it's titanium oxide that was oxidized in an active electrochemical cell. To the right here is an aqueous reservoir. And so by applying a voltage, a potential in this cell, just like we've used the cell that we studied the lipid uh, bilayer melting system in, you can apply potential and oxidize at will and study in situ what happens. So the titanium, which originally extended out here, now gets oxidized. There's an oxide layer and, and a titanium layer. Now all of these, this family of lines is a, is, is a set, a series of fits to the reflected intensity data. So you do some kind of uh, uh, fitting routine, uh, parametric B spline, whatever, and get these really nice fits. But because the data is truncated, you didn't do the Fourier transform uh, essentially to infinity, but you, have to, you only have data that go out to here and there's some statistical fluctuation in the data, that gives rise to uncertainty in the reflectivity profile. But it looks good. I mean, here is some, this gives you some idea of your confidence in what that profile is. So it basically looks something like this. Titanium oxide, titanium substrate, reservoir. Okay, 
But if you are a perfectionist and you say, well, let me fit some more and see if I can get you know, even tighter family of curves. Well, something really bad happens. You could get a whole nother family of curves, not like this, that was shown. I've only shown one average value from both sets. But here is another family of lines that's completely different, okay? So that goes back to your question that, okay, now I don't know what's coming first here. You know, this is completely reversed. But if you take both family, both sets of curves, they fit that data to exactly the same goodness of fit, same chi squared. Okay, so again, what's going on here is you probably already know we've lost the phase information. We do not measure the amplitude in the phase. We measure this quantity squared. So all of the phase information, all of the location of where things are in space that are determined by the phase of the wave, the neutron ruler, if you will, as it goes into the material, that's just lost. It's just squared away because we only know how to measure the squared wave function because it's the square of the wave function that's the probability of finding the scattered neutron or x-ray at some point in our detector. That's all that quantum mechanics allows us to measure. So we're actually reduced to a trial and error system, which still works, where you fit the data by taking different models and seeing how good they fit the data. And the right solution is in there. The trouble is there are other ambiguous solutions along with it, and you have to somehow separate them. If you were able to measure the reflection amplitude with the phase, then you would able, it turns out, even though this is not the exact Fourier transform, even though we're solving the Schrodinger equation in the so-called dynamical or strong scattering regime, you can still find a mathematical way of retrieving unambiguously and exactly that reflection profile without the uh, error. And that is done by the following, following uh, uh, procedure. So suppose the red represents the profile, just a simple rectangular profile that I'm trying to measure, the unknown. If I put next to it, adjacent to it, another film, but varying it, so I have three samples with three different values of this adjacent reference film, then it turns out that you can algebraically reduce without going into all of the detail and retrieve from this the reflection amplitude for the unknown part alone, presuming that the re reference materials and their profiles are known. So they become, it's like holography. You, you actually put in some reference thing and you can get out of that the amplitudes of the actual waves. And then to invert, it turns out that the, 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 a group of Russian mathematicians back in the 50s found that you can do for this very strong scattering situation what's a, a sort of a, a, a more elaborate Fourier transform uh, integral equation solution that gives you directly back, again, just as this one-dimensional case, which is applicable for specular scattering, the, the solution. So here, here's an example. Here is uh, a particular lipid bilayer, the same one that was used in that Melaton study to make sure that we actually knew what we were talking about because somebody would say, well, how do you know the Melaton didn't just sink to the bottom leaflet and you got the thing backwards? Well, here's two reflectivity data sets, the black and the red at the top. And this is done by changing, in this case, instead of some film inside the sample, it was just the incident medium was changed from silicon to sapphire two very different scattering densities. So one data set for silicon, one data set for sapphire. And then if you do that mathematical analysis shown on the previous slides, out comes the blue curve, which is the real part of the reflection amplitude, not the square, the reflection amplitude, just for the part of the potential that's unknown, this lipid bilayer film. And the white is the molecular dynamics simulation. The red is the actual exact inversion of this data. No fudge factors, no parameters. The data went in, went through the equations, and now comes unambiguously this profile. Now, it really looks good here. And you see a lot of wiggles in the gold, which are not, are not real. But those are just ringing truncation errors that come from the fact that you cut off the data at point three. 
You can show from model calculations and, and so on that if you had been able to measure out much further in Q to the right, then these oscillations actually die away. So to, to the extent to which you can measure the data and have, uh, to the extent to which you can have minimized the error, that gives you an idea of the goodness of fit. But you can clearly see that this rules out any ambiguity about making a mistake about where the melaton actually is. It's out here, not in here. Okay, and I'm gonna skip this. This just gives you more detail about that. Um, we have five minutes more for this. So let's, let's go through this other example. This is, this is kind of between soft and hard condensed matter. It, it, it's a study that people at Delaware did. They were interested in producing organic solar cells. And the morphology of these organic cells are ver is very important. And again, I'm not a chemist either, so uh, my knowledge is very limited about the details of the chemistry involved. But essentially, it, there are two components to this organic layer. One is what's a buckyball, uh, this, this carbon C60 molecule with some additional pieces on it embedded in this material called P3HT, and it's actually spelled out there, and I, I won't attempt to pronounce it. But the idea is that when light comes in, it creates what's called an exciton, and this exciton is the charge transfer mechanism. It's what carry, creates the current to flow through there, but it has a diffusion length of about 10 nanometers in this composite chemical system. So you have to get the morphology right. You have to mix these two chemical pieces together right so that when you do produce excitons, they can propagate across and through without getting totally absorbed in the process. So it turns out that the ideal morphology would be some kind of comb-like structure like this where one penetrates the other and the other penetrates back so that this gives you, if this dimension is of the order 10 nan nanometers, the optimum conductivity. Uh, uh, well, let's say the optimum uh, current produced. So the question is, if I go and make one of these organic systems, how do I know where the two chemical components actually are? So in some cases, you can deuterate one, hydrogenate the other, and do neutron reflectometry and try to see what the morphology, again, do the scattering experiment to see whether this is what you have or it's something like this. So the experiment was done. And we also did this experiment with the phase uh, uh, reference layer so we could get the phase information out because in this particular case, we have no idea what's in those chemical, how those chemical layers rearrange themselves. So you really want to be sure that the answer you publish in the literature is you know, relatively uh, uh, accurate. So, the experiment was done in this case just by changing, putting that solar cell organic film next to a D2O reservoir and then just next to air. And those two backing media supply the two references that you need to collect the phase information. So here is uh, the real part of the scattering density distribution for just the chemical film that's extracted from the measurements. This is the imaginary part that you also get. We don't need to talk about here. And the results are this green, or this is this red line here with some oscillation in the middle, but it's relatively flat. And you can see that the uh, buckyball high, the PCBM component of that film concentrates at the two interfaces next to the silicon and next to the air. So it just goes out like this, and it isn't well distributed. It doesn't look like a comb. It's actually a really bad organic photovoltaic device. But actually, now people know, making these things, that this is not the way to do it. Okay? Unfortunately, it would be great if it was spectacularly wonderful, but it wasn't. On this curve, I just mentioned, because when you actually start doing reflectometry, there is also a green curve, which is, exact, is also a fit to this data. But it was done by fitting the two sets of data, the one with the D2O backing, the one with the air backing, simultaneously. And it turns out you don't have to do that fancy Gelfand, Levikon, Marchenko inversion process. If you just do the reference measurement where you have two different references and measure two sets of composite reflection data and simultaneously fit them together, it also has some phase information in it. And it's just this equivalent way of doing it. 
And the virtue of doing that is that in some areas where you have other constraints, you can apply them. Like we had a gold film, you could say, oh, I know it's a constant density, and I can apply that constraint, and you get even better results by doing that. Okay, this is just to show that, this, the, that the fluctuations that we measure are not the ringing effect that we saw before in that other data. The ringing effects are relatively small. They're of the order of a tenth of the height of those peaks at the interfaces. Okay, so unbelievably, some, by some miracle, we finished within a minute of the scheduled time for the first lecture. I don't think this has ever happened before. It must be because you're all sitting up front. But anyway, uh, we have a, you know, a few minutes for questions if you want to ask anything. Yes? Okay, so if you have a set of data, uh, you can write a program that looks at the composite, the two sets of data actually as one. And you can say that in your chi, your chi squares can be set so that there is a mutual kind of goodness of fit so that the minimum has to be the minimum for both sets of data together. There are many ways to do this. And uh, you could you know, think of various ways of writing it, but there exist, I, I, I don't know the names of the programs, but we have several programs at NIST where you can do this. And in fact, I think they even have a program now where you can take x-ray data over the same Q range, normalized properly to be real reflectivity, that is reflected intensity divided by incident intensity, and simultaneously fit the x-ray and the neutron data together as well. Okay, that's another excellent question, but uh, that's in the details, but you have to make it so that your goodness of fit criteria represent both of them. It can't be just really good for one and not the other. They have to sort of go back and forth for both, so they both simultaneously reduce better and better on both sets of data. Yes? Yes. So it, you have to think, go way, way, okay, so the question was when you're doing this specular reflection and doing a depth profiling, what's the resolution in the real space? So if you go way, way back here, no, going the wrong way. Let me do this because it is an important question. Whoops. Okay, so here's a typical example. This. If I collect data, it's, I guess it's kind of hard to see this, out to point three reciprocal angstroms, then the fit of that data give you a curve. This is, again, fitting. This is not phase inversion or anything like this. It's just fitting the data. Constrained to knowing that the gold is first, okay? So you impose that constraint so you just kind of make sure you get the things in the right order, at least in, insofar as this part is concerned. But the purple line is this broad line here. You don't get any of these detailed squaring up of the profile. So it has a resolution of something like 10 angstroms or a nanometer. And again, oh, there's, there's this, one, this other beautiful thing. If you have a model system you want to study, you can make this, you could make any model of a system that you want and calculate the reflectivity that you expect to get with, you know, a few percent accuracy. So before you have to spend a lot of time, hard work in the lab making samples to answer a specific question about where something is in the sample, you can go model it. And if you model the system and you say, well, I want to see this little red peak over here, but I can only measure data up to this Q, are you going to see that? No, it's not good enough. To get this red peak here, to see that, I've got to go all the way out to uh, one reciprocal angstrom. So if you know your machine, your instruments or samples are such that you can't go that far, then you can't expect to see that. But so you can answer your own question, your question exactly, specifically for any system you want just by making those models. You know, make, of course you don't know exactly what it is, but you make some reasonable guess about what you think you want to see. And if you can see it, you'll, find, you'll know it by doing that calculation, okay? No, a great question. This is the best class ever. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, thi I think what you're asking is that you make some system up and 
how the scattering length density is distributed is itself a little bit ambiguous because you can have atoms or nuclei A, B, C, D, and they don't necessarily have a unique relationship to a scattering length number or density. So what we really measure are the scattering length densities, but then we have to infer from that back what the real composition profile is. You know, you could have a big scattering density and a low, a big scattering length and a low density, or a low density and a big scattering length, and they can have the same product numbers, and you can't know which is which unless you have some idea what you put into the sample. Is that what you were asking? Yeah. Yes, okay. Yes, okay. So the question is, okay, I think, if you have some uh, nanostructure on the surface, what you put behind it, either D2O or air, changes what the reflectivity curve looks like. So again, this is where the science becomes kind of art. You have to take your model systems and try calculating a model that has D2O here or H2O or air or nothing and see which gives you the most sensitivity for that part of the structure that you're most interested in looking at. And you can answer that question for yourself. Again, just by doing those calculations, you put them there. So if I put D2O here, as opposed to air, it changes the shape of this curve completely, <coughs> completely different thing. <coughs> Excuse me. But the good thing is that I know, at least I think I know what I'm doing by putting the D2O there. It's a controllable, uh, change that you've made. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, right. Okay. <laughs>